hard. Probably the most work going on in the industry right now to do cross-site scripting stuff securely. The people who are actually thinking hardest about how to actually do these complex security models, Adobe is doing a really, really good job of this. And they built this entire huge framework for XML documents that describe security policies. And unfortunately, that XML stuff is also vulnerable to DNS rebinding as well. So you get around the security policy by using the same attack. Uh, the effect sucks. You get arbitrary TCP access. Um, you have to do some tricks to get below port 1024 as if that meant anything anymore. Uh, who in this room thinks ports below 1024 is at all a security use at all? If you see, okay, so here's the deal. Traditionally, the idea was, okay, users will use servers on ports above 1024. Administrators below 1024. Now you'll be able to differentiate a user started service from a system started service. This seemed like a great idea at the time. And then you look at ports like, uh, you know, uh, RDP above 1024, MySQL above 1024, SQL Server above 1024. Turns out there's a crap ton of really useful stuff that's above port 1024. So it's a, kind of a useless security mechanism now. So mechanisms for rebinding address. How do you actually get Flash to see motion from, okay, download this movie from this address, get this security policy from this address, but now, only now, should you go ahead and go over there. How are we going to do that? All right, we got three ways. First way is what's been commonly known, the other two I'm bringing to the table. Um, so the first way is called temporal modulation. When you get a record back from DNS, it's got a time to live. It says, this value you should hold on to for this many seconds. And that value can be zero. And what happens is it says, oh, okay. The first time you look it up, you get an address. The second time you look it up, don't cache it. It might have changed. Get an address. Third time, don't cache it. It still might have changed. Go look it up. This happens to be the exact functionality that we want to abuse. We want you to look it up at time A and go to the server in Europe, and time B and go to the printer down the hall. So we'll just use it for what it's meant for. And so you get these networks, they brag, oh, we've solved this problem for years. We say records have to last at least five minutes. Because you know, hackers just can't wait five minutes to break into your network. <laughs> but all right. You want to play that game. It turns out we got two more. Guess what else you can do in DNS? You can return two records at the same time. Yeah, so basically when you look up bar.com, it returns both the address out in Europe and the address to the printer down the hall. Now there's a bit of a problem. What if the browser picks wrong? You know, sometimes you want it to go to one address, sometimes you want it to go to the other. What if the browser guesses incorrectly? Well, I've got this really crazy, awesome hack. It's called trying again. <laughs> Amazing how well that works. And I'm not going to go too hard into you know, how the trying again works, but um, here's a big, messy slide that tells you how to try again. So, <laughs> people are trying to use DNS TTLs as security technology. They were never designed to be a security technology. Things always die when you decide to turn one into them. Finally, we have something less a security technology than virtual machines. So I used to call this Tommy the Tank Engine Security. I think it's safe. I think it's safe. I think it's no. It turns out that's the wrong tank engine that says that. No, it's actually, and I'm not joking, the pony engine that says that. Wow. So it turns out overriding a TTL when you actually own the record at play is trivial. It's by design. Here's how you do it. So when you look something up in DNS, you do not necessarily get back an address directly. Oh, no. You can get something called a C name that says, I know you looked up bar, but bar is just an alias, man. That's actually 2.bar, and here's 2.par's new address. It turns out this, oh, and here's its new address, actually overrides whatever was in the cache, regardless of TTLs. Works like everywhere. So here's what it actually looks like. We're going to look up one.foo.notmallory.com because, you know, the server's totally not Mallory. It's totally not malicious out to hack you. You can tell because it says it's not Mallory. 
All right. So we're going to look up one.foo.notmallory.com. And it's going to reply and it's going to say, nah, 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 you didn't mean one.foo. You meant bar.foo.notmallory.com. And here's its address. And indeed, when you check the cache, you'll say, okay, bar.foo.notmallory.com. Nine seconds ago, 120 minus 111, nine. I can do arithmetic. Bar.foo is going to go to 10.00. Sweet. This should be valid for another 111 seconds. Unless we look up 2.foo.notmallory.com. And it as well is going to say, no, you meant bar.foo. But here's bar.foo's new address, just so you know. Now, when we look it up, oh, look, it has immediately rebound to a new address. Sweet. I hope you enjoyed that five-minute limitation of yours because it totally broke. <laughs> so, review. By swapping addresses out from underneath a web browser, we can get arbitrary TCP and sometimes even UDP access to hosts reachable by the client. What can we do with this? Ah, oh, hell. Can we VPN into corporate networks using nothing but a Lord web browser? Sure, it's easy. Okay, it's a total pain in the ass. It takes like seven programming languages and six protocols. What is it with the web designers out there? Every time you blink, you're in a new programming language. <laughs> totally easy. All right, we got three actors in this little dance. We got a browser. Browser's got access to internal resources. We got an attacker. The attacker wants access to these internal resources. And then, then we got the proxy. And the proxy is going to hook the browser up to the attacker. And the software I've written to do this, and the name will make sense in a while, is called Slurpee. Slurpee is a multi protocol server built using the Perl object environment. Very nice, non-blocking, supports one server with lots and lots of different protocols that it handles. And it turns out what we need to do, the attacker is going to give us TCP streams that need to be sent off through the browser. The browser is going to pull down these TCP streams over HTTP. Remember, so the deal is, is that the browser is like a, a network stack that you get to give code to. This is awesome. Um, Slurpee's got to handle DNS. All those crazy DNS tricks, yeah, Bind ain't doing that. <laughs> so we need to have a Slurpee run DNS. And because there's some security policy stuff that Flash handles uh, called an XML socket, we got to put in a server for that too. And that wasn't a big deal. The basic theme is the attacker connects to the proxy, which manages the appropriate resources in the browser to service the attacker's connections. Now, what we do is we build what I call a bucket of sockets. The browser connects. It establishes an iframe called a bucket. The bucket pulls for new connections to establish. And usually there'll be nothing there. But you know, eventually, eventually the attacker's gonna have something he wants. You know, like, I wanna go to 10.001 port 80. And the attacker's going to register with the proxy and say, hey, give me access to this. Browser is gonna to come to the proxy and say, hey, you got anything for me? Proxy's like, yeah, I got something for you. Give me a connection to 10.0.1.80. Now the browser spins up a second level iframe. It is stored in this big, this original iframe is the bucket. And each of the child iframes in there, that is the socket. It's like a socket, but it sucks. <laughs> now, the bucket comes from, you know, whatever site bucket.notmallory.com, but each of these suckets comes from a dynamically addressed site, address. In this case, say 10001fooproxydomain.com. Now that doesn't mean it resolves to 10001 yet. It just will at some point in the future. This second level iframe is called a socket. You're gonna